Tonight, fire and floods, the severe weather from coast to coast. The new images tonight of homes engulfed in flames as deadly wildfires ripped through California, cruised in the air and on the ground met with fierce winds and sweltering heat. And in the northeast, storms drenching some cities with up to five inches of rain in just 24 hours. A tree toppling onto an apartment complex in Connecticut. We're tracking it all. Also, the tragic end in the days long search for a teacher kidnapped while jogging in Memphis. The mother of two found dead in an abandoned home. So was she targeted? What we're learning about her suspected abductor, including a previous kidnapping conviction. The fight for Congress, all eyes on Pennsylvania, and the Senate race between Dr. Oz and his Democratic challenger, John Fetterman. Oz campaigning with former President Trump, but will he be able to help Republicans regain control of Congress? The top Democratic pollster saying it could go either way this midterm cycle as President Biden ramps up his attacks on former President Trump, plus the dramatic takedown of a suspected cop killer. Video showing a squad car ramming the suspect's trailered boat during a chase on an Oklahoma highway. Bullets flying past other drivers, how it finally came to an end at a toll booth. Survivors trapped a deadly earthquake hitting southwest China, toppling buildings and cutting off access to rural areas. The race tonight to save those stuck under the rubble. And is it time to worry, darling? The highly anticipated premiere of Olivia Wilde's new film starring Harry Styles and Florence Pugh. But it's the drama off screen that is taking the internet by storm. Top Story starts right now. Hey, good evening. More than 40 million Americans on alert for dangerous heat tonight and those sweltering temperatures fueling deadly wildfires out west. This is the scene in Hemet, California, about 80 miles south of Los Angeles. The blaze engulfing thousands of acres and taking out homes in its path. At least two people killed. More than 4,000 firefighters now trying to fight at least 14 large wildfires burning across that state, including the Mountain Fire in Northern California, which has ballooned to more than 11,000 acres and has also turned deadly. Meanwhile, in the Northeast, storms toppling this massive tree in Hartford, Connecticut. Several cars crushed and apartment windows smashed. Parts of the Jersey Shore also flooded. Take a look. After a near total washout along the East Coast, some areas seen up to five inches of rain. But we begin with those deadly wildfires out west. And Miguel Almaguer, who tonight is in the fire zone. And Miguel, we can see that smoke hovering over those power lines. Tom, good evening. It certainly is a very ominous sign. And tonight, California is under a triple threat. We have those scorching hot temperatures out here, the threat of rolling blackouts. And as you mentioned, you can see behind that power substation behind me, a fast moving wildfire. It exploded out of control so quickly, authorities say at least two people were unable to escape the flames. Another burn victim narrowly made it out alive during evacuations. The Southern California blaze destroying homes near the town of Hemet, fueled by conditions that acted like a blowtorch. The fire was in alignment with the canyon, with the wind and the topography, so everything lined up for a critical rate of spread. The inferno blew through here so quickly, many of the homes that were destroyed were lost in minutes. Those that made it were protected by fire retardant dropped from the sky or random luck. With California wildfires killing four people in just days, historic heat is still baking the West. Horrible, it's just so hot. The 46 million struggling through sweltering conditions that have lasted a week won't see relief for days. After shattering records, several cities will stay above or near triple digits through much of the week, the worst heat wave of its kind in 150 years. I, yeah, we're melting. As some cities record their hottest day today, the suffocating heat dome over the West has only intensified because of climate change. Fall temperatures increase nearly three degrees across the country since 1970, making today's record temperatures five times more likely. Tonight, the strain on California's fragile power grid could finally snap. With demand for power forecasted to outpace supply, the Golden State is again on the verge of plunging into the dark. 
Miguel Almaguer joins us now from Hemet, California. Miguel, I want to go back to that heat in just a moment, but first, let's focus on those wildfires in California. You mentioned the ones burning in Southern California, but what more do we know about that large fire we were covering last week in the northern part of the state? Well, Tom, there's finally some good news on that wildfire. Firefighters are getting a better handle on the blaze. It's no longer threatening as many homes. It's still on the move. And of course, as you know, two more people were killed in that wildfire. That's four people killed by these fast moving wildfires across the state of California in just a matter of days, Tom. All right, and Miguel, in Southern California, where you are tonight for us, that heat, Los Angeles residents mindful of the potential power issues you've been mentioning, but now also being asked to conserve water. Yeah, Tom, millions of people in the Los Angeles area are being asked to conserve water because they're actually fixing pipes underground. So they need to conserve water. That, of course, comes during this scorching heat wave. So people are being asked not only to conserve water, but also to turn up their air conditioning units and not use power if they can, Tom. All right, Miguel Almaguer leading us off tonight here on Top Story. Miguel, our thanks to you. For more on the fire danger in the West, I want to bring in NBC News meteorologist Michelle Grossman, who's also going to tell us about the latest on this unrelenting heat. Michelle, good evening. Hey there, Tom. Yeah, this heat just goes on and on. We're on day seven. We're looking at temperatures well into the triple digits once again. 51, American, 51 million Americans under a heat alert, whether it's a heat advisory or an excessive heat warning. Where you see that hot pink, that's the excessive heat warning. Many uh, portions of California, the valleys, mountains, the deserts, seeing temperatures well above normal for this time of year. So temperature-wise, tomorrow we're looking at temperatures 20 degrees above normal in Sacramento at 109. So 10, 20, even 30 degrees above average for this time of year. Rapid City 101. And as we go throughout the rest of the week, we're looking at temperatures really warm, too. Tom, it's not until the weekend, Saturday, where we see some relief. Shell, back here in the Northeast, heavy rainfall earlier today, causing severe flooding and destruction all across the region. I want to show you some videos now. You see it here, this post office in Providence, Rhode Island, inundated with water, that flooding, halting mail delivery, of course. And Michelle, it seems like it's been raining all day here in the Northeast. What's the latest on the flooding threat? Yeah, that's right. It's that extreme weather continuing even on the East Coast. We have an area of low pressure that's creeping off the coast. So we still have rain falling at this hour. Where you see those brighter colors, the reds, the oranges, the yellows, that's where we're seeing those heavy downpours. Any of these showers and storms are capable of producing heavy downpours and some flash flooding. So that will be the risk tonight into tomorrow where you see those yellows and reds. And as we go throughout tomorrow, that area of low pressure is going to move slowly off the coast. We're going to see those morning showers lingering over the Northeast and then some storms developing in the Southeast. So we're going to see heavy rain in the southeast. And then as we go throughout the later part of the week by Thursday, storms developing around the Gulf Coast and Florida once again. They were so saturated last week into the early part of this week. Got a little bit of a break, but they're seeing some heavy rain and we could see some flash flooding as well there. Tom? All right, going to be a busy weather week. Uh, Michelle, we thank you. We want to move on now to our other big story of the night. After a days long search for a missing mother and teacher, police announced they found her body. The revelations come in as the man accused of murdering Eliza Fletcher appeared in court today. NBC's Jesse Kirsch was there. More than four days after Eliza Fletcher vanished, tonight the desperate search for that Memphis mother of two ending in tragedy. Police finding Fletcher's body late Monday behind an empty home roughly half a mile from where court documents say her alleged killer tried covering up his crime. You're not able to afford a lawyer, is that correct? Standing before a Shelby County judge this morning, 38-year-old Cleotha Abstin faced multiple charges, including especially aggravated kidnapping. Tomorrow, he'll be arraigned on two more charges, including first-degree murder. He has not yet entered a plea. While the outcome of this investigation is not what we hoped for, we are nonetheless pleased to remove this dangerous predator off the streets of Memphis. Authorities say Abstin abducted the 34-year-old teacher on her morning run early Friday, forced her into this SUV, and ultimately killed someone he did not know. To lose someone so young and so vital is a tragedy in and of itself, but to have it happen in this way with a senseless act of violence, it's unimaginable. Evidence eventually leading to Abstin, even as Fletcher remained missing. Did the suspect ultimately help you find this victim? We have not gotten very much information from that individual. Now, memorials grow near the University of Memphis where Fletcher disappeared. Her church and school reeling as her family suffers immeasurable loss. Saying in a statement, they're heartbroken and devastated, asking for privacy. Saying Liza was such a joy to so many. All right, Jesse Kirsch joins us now live from Memphis tonight. Jesse, do we know how investigators 
located her body at that home. I know you reported it wasn't far from the scene of the abduction. Right, and Tom, what led police to this area is that they heard from two witnesses, including the suspect's brother, according to an affidavit, that the suspect was seen cleaning out a vehicle with floor cleaner and washing his clothes in a sink. Odd behavior, and so that led police to the general area where they ultimately found, unfortunately, the remains of Eliza Fletcher. The amended affidavit, which has been updated, describes officers smelling decay, seeing a body on the ground, and that body, unfortunately, was unresponsive, Tom. Such a, a horrible set of circumstances. Do, do we know at what time Eliza Fletcher took off for that run? And do police think that this kidnapping was planned or absent happened to see her during that jog? Yeah, according to authorities, it's believed that Eliza Fletcher left her home for her morning run around 4 a.m., and it's about 30 minutes later, according to police, when she was allegedly abducted by the suspect who is now charged with her kidnapping and ultimately with her murder. As far as what else is out there, obviously there are some details that are being kept close to the vest, but authorities did tell us earlier they believe this was an isolated incident, a stranger attacking and killing someone he did not know. That's the allegation from a Authorities, Tom. All right, Jesse Kirsch, with a lot of new reporting on this story. So many have been following. Jesse, we thank you for that. Okay, we turn to politics now into the battle over those documents seized at former President Trump's Florida home. The court now waiting for the Justice Department's response after a judge ruled a special master should review the documents. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has the latest. Tonight, the Justice Department is still weighing whether to appeal a federal judge's ruling to grant an independent third party, what's called a special master, to conduct a review of documents seized from Mar-a-Lago last month. That ruling, a win for former President Trump after FBI agents seized more than 11,000 government documents from his home, including hundreds marked classified. The decision will not halt the DOJ's criminal investigation into potential mishandling of secret documents, but it will pause their ability to use those seized documents in their investigation, while that special master determines whether any of those materials the FBI took are privileged, making them off limits to federal prosecutors. The former president is blasting the investigation as politically motivated. The Mar-a-Lago raid was a desperate effort to distract from Joe Biden's record of misery and failure. But tonight, Mr. Trump's 2016 opponent, Hillary Clinton, is blaming him for the events surrounding January 6th, speaking with CBS News. I would not be honest if I didn't say I think there was a seditious conspiracy against the government of the United States, and that's a crime, led by Donald Trump, encouraged by Donald Trump. It comes as NBC News has obtained new surveillance video from the day after January 6th that shows several Trump-linked technology consultants looking for evidence that Mr. Trump's defeat was fraudulent, being given access to a Georgia elections office by a local Republican official. That same day, the voting system there was allegedly breached. Latham's lawyer did not respond to NBC News, but has previously denied Trump supporters were given access to election equipment. Meanwhile, President Biden is again defending his earlier attacks on Mr. Trump and his supporters, whose beliefs last week he compared to semi-fascism, insisting they are separate from the mainstream GOP. The extreme MAGA Republicans in Congress have chosen to go backwards, full of anger, violence, hate and division. Peter joins us now from the White House. Peter, I want to go back to where you began. If the DOJ doesn't appeal, how long would it take a special master to review all of those materials that were seized? Yeah, Tom, it's a good question. The special master would have to go through, as you note, about 11,000 documents looking for anything that's protected by either attorney client or executive privilege, according to the judge. So will the special master be allowed to review the classified documents? Can they hire clerks? All that could impact the answer here. But experts I've spoken to say the process would likely take days or perhaps a couple of weeks, Tom. So, Peter, do, do we get the name of the special master on Friday, or is that just the deadline for both sides, including former President Trump, to submit names of potential candidates to serve as a special master? Yeah, that is the deadline for both sides to submit their names. And obviously, the two sides are not going to agree here. So this could wind up being a long, tortured process before the judge herself settles on that special master.
Tom. All right, Peter Alexander clearing it up for us. Peter, we thank you. Now to power and politics in the critical race in Pennsylvania. With control of the Senate at stake, Dr. Oz ramping up attacks on Democrat John Fetterman, who has refused to debate since having a stroke in May. The two candidates getting a presidential boost with both Biden and Trump on the ground in the battleground state this weekend. NBC's Vaughn Hilliard is on the campaign trail for us tonight. The critical state of Pennsylvania is at the center of the political universe this week. He's going to work and fight for Pennsylvania. Thank you. Dr. Mehmet Oz facing an uphill battle to win his Senate race, a loss being a critical blow to Republicans' chances of winning back the Senate. Doctors fix things. I would actively work to change us for the better. Polls are showing Oz trailing Democrat John Fetterman, who campaigned alongside President Biden on Monday night in Pittsburgh, slamming Oz as an outsider. How many homes does Dr. Oz have? Nine, 10, 11? But Fetterman so far refusing to debate Oz after suffering a stroke in May. John Fetterman is either healthy and he's dodging the debates because he does not want to answer for his radical left positions or he's too sick to participate in the debate. Can you even imagine that if you had a doctor that was mocking your illness? Yes. Ridiculing that? Well, here we are. Oz in a state that Joe Biden won, walking a tightrope. If you had been in the U.S. Senate on January 6th of 2021, would you have objected to the certification of the 2020 election and Joe Biden's win? I would not have objected to it. By the time the delegates and those reports were sent to the U.S. Senate, our job was to approve it, which is what I would have done. But also appealing to Trump loyal voters. I believe in each and every one of you, and so should you. God bless you. Campaigning with the former president at a rally this weekend. This November, we're going to stand up to this rising tyranny of sickness, lawlessness, and death, and we are going to take back our country. President Biden with his own attacks aimed at Trump. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. One of those MAGA Republicans, Doug Mastriano, running for governor of Pennsylvania. He was outside the Capitol on January 6 and has said he would not have certified Biden's win in the state. His Democratic opponent running this ad against him. Body my choice is ridiculous nonsense. Candidate Josh Shapiro telling NBC's Mike Memoli. I'm running against the most extreme and dangerous candidate in the nation. Someone who talks openly about denying women the ability to make decisions over their own body. Someone who's talked about rigging the 2024 election already. Now, as these two Republicans, Mastriano and Oz, try to forge their own paths forward, Oz was asked whether he will support his fellow Republican. He said, notably, that yes, he will support Mastriano in the full slate of Republican candidates, but stopped short of saying whether he would actually campaign alongside him or not. For Democrats, this U.S. Senate race is perhaps their best pickup opportunity here. And it's important to note that early voting begins in just a few weeks. Tom? All right, Vaughn Hilliard from Pennsylvania for us. Vaughn, we thank you for that. Just two months away, Republican candidates in key races are struggling to move ahead as Democrats remain hopeful they can keep control of Congress. I want to bring in a real Washington insider, Tara Palmieri, who joins us in studio. She writes the Washington Mall for Puck News. And Tara, you spoke to a top pollster for Democrats, maybe the, the highest top pollster, if you will. Um, he helped Joe Biden in 2020. Uh, his name's John Anzalone, and he said this to you, which I want to put on the screen right now, which I thought was interesting. He said, we're in the most unique election cycle in my 30 years of working in politics, I literally went from saying it was the worst election cycle I've ever seen to now it being one of the most competitive election cycles I've ever seen. Republicans should really uh, sh should have a plus 10 generic ballot advantage. They're dead even. Okay, th the question I have for you is, I, I don't think he's lying to you, but I'm surprised he's raising the bar because Democrats were in such a bad position a couple of months ago. Absolutely. I mean, it's a pretty bold pronouncement to make. But I do think what he's seeing and what other Democrats are seeing is there is an insane amount of enthusiasm and voter turnout among women after the Roe decision um, was overturned. And, and he said initially he didn't think it was going to be this impactful, and it's had this huge impact. Actually, a lot of Democrats, insiders, strategists, candidates, they all thought, oh, it'll have a marginal role. Or people will move on. They'll forget about it. Exactly. But now you're seeing these special elections. You're seeing the referendum in Kansas. And the turnout for Democrats is astronomical. And I 
think that they've tapped into something that they didn't know that they had. And you, we know throughout history that, for the most part, the party in power, the party of the president, they tend to lose in a midterm election. But there have been some anomalies, and usually it's around a rare, you know, political uh, earthquake, and I would say the overturning of Roe versus Wade is one of them. And Republicans were very extreme on the issue because they were in the in the uh, heat of their primaries when the leak of the draft first came out in May. And so they said, "I'm against abortion in cases." Not all of them, but many of them said, yeah. "I'm against abortion in cases of rape and incest." And that has been used against them in general elections when some people think that's a little too extreme for the state. So again, he's a Democratic pollster, and you right. you, you really worked him over. I, I invite people to read the article because it was kind of funny. You, you, you put out the whole the entire interview because of some of his answers he did not want to touch the issue of crime at all did that stand out to you yes in fact i brought it up a few times and he was like what they know this is a weakness for democrats and republican strategists tell me we should be hitting them more on crime we should be on the offense on crime as much as we can they feel like they're flat-footed on abortion and Trump, frankly, and having to defend the Mar-a-Lago search. And so as much as Republicans would like to be putting out more ads on crime, I think that they feel like they can't. They also have some money issues that Democrats don't have. That's a bigger story. But yeah, Republicans are definitely suffering in terms of campaign fundraising and, and being able to buy ads to, to put out. The and when you have limited ad buying money, picking yeah. between crime and the economy, and, and it seems to swing every day, that's also a tough choice. You also have something interesting that I, I don't think it was in the, the story, but it's, it was in the newsletter, some, some new reporting on Governor Ron DeSantis, his relationship with President Trump, and possibly launching a campaign in 2024. That's right. So President Trump and Ron DeSantis have a very tense relationship at this point, even though Trump did endorse him in 2018 when he was first running in the primary. It helped him to win the primary, in fact. But now, Trump, a former president, wants to be asked to endorse Ron DeSantis for his second gubernatorial run. And DeSantis has not asked Donald Trump yet. And I know that he is anxiously waiting for this ask. And in fact, his aide said, OK, if he doesn't ask you to endorse him, just do it and then use it as an opportunity to point out the many ways in which you have you know, your president of the United States, you won by more points in Florida than he did mm -hmm. in his gubernatorial race, and to kind of use it as a way to, to snub him, because they're they could in fact be um, rivals in a Republican primary. And as you see, you know, Ron DeSantis is out on the campaign trail, and he sounds a lot like Trump, and he talks a lot like Trump. And at one time, he really embraced him, but you don't hear him saying his name anymore. And he's campaigning like crazy for those primary voters. He's right. trying to cut into that MAGA crowd exactly. incredibly hard. And, I, and a lot of people, Republican voters and strategists, believe that that's going to be the matchup if they both decide to run. Tara Palmieri always has great scoops. Thank Puck, you. make sure to read it. All right, Tara, thank you. Still ahead tonight, the manhunt in Las Vegas, a reporter who covers organized crime and corruption, stabbed to death outside of his home. So do police believe his killing is connected to his work? The details next. Plus, the wild police chase caught on camera, a suspected cop killer fleeing while trailering a boat. The dramatic takedown on a highway and the deadly seaplane crash over the holiday weekend. The victims identified, including the family of an actress. Stay with us. Next tonight to the highway takedown caught on camera. A man accused of shooting two deputies, killing one of them, and leading police on a high-speed chase while his boat trailed behind him. The suspect and officers exchanging gunfire as innocent bystanders drove by. NBC's Maggie Vespa with that video tonight. Bullets whizzing down an Oklahoma freeway. A squad car ramming an accused killer's boat. And an officer taking aim at a speeding truck. All of it, including the dramatic arrest, hey, 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 hey. captured on body and dash cam video just released by Oklahoma City Police, the agency investigating the murder of Oklahoma County Sheriff Sergeant Bobby Schwartz and the shooting of Deputy Mark Johns, who survived. It happened just over two weeks ago on August 22nd, when authorities say the pair, along with a third deputy, came to this Oklahoma City house to serve eviction papers to 35-year-old Benjamin Plank. NBC affiliate KFOR reporting the eviction came at the request of Plank's mother, who had filed a protective order against him, according to court documents. Police say Plank refused to come out, moments later firing at deputies, hitting both Schwartz and Johns. 
Authorities say Plank then took off in this gray truck, a boat attached to the back. The suspect refused to stop for the officers, initiating a pursuit. Oklahoma City police releasing a narrated montage of the chase video, pointing out Plank appearing to fire at officers. Officers firing back. One even shooting through his windshield. It's just a reminder that police work is very, very dangerous. Uh, eviction notice of all things. You're just going there to ask somebody to please vacate a premise, and it winds up with the loss of life. Investigators say no one was injured during the chase. Authorities say the officers who fired are on paid leave per protocol. Move everybody! Get everybody out! Eventually, hands in the air, Plank appears to surrender. Officers arrest and tase him. Get on your oh! Oh! Get on your oh, Get on your oh! Investigators say they later found a number of weapons in his vehicle. Efforts by NBC News to contact Plank and his mother have been unsuccessful. Now, Sergeant Schwartz's family mourning an unthinkable loss. The local sheriff breaking down in tears. Law enforcement is it's a tight community, and, and I'm so thankful. They were screaming across the state for my guys. <laughs> oh my God. Maggie Vespa joins us now live here on Top Story. Maggie, it, it's so sad that Sergeant Schwartz lost his life over an eviction notice. I, I have a couple questions. Right. Do we know where this case stands right now? And then also, and I guess it might be a mystery, is, is there any reason why the alleged shooter here, the person who killed Sergeant Schwartz allegedly, decided to escape with a, a boat hitched to the back of his car? <laughs> I know, it's one of the most bizarre parts of this story, one of many bizarre parts. Um, we don't know point blank. That, along with many other details, haven't been addressed in the court documents. It's very possible that he was just trying to get away quickly and didn't have time to unhitch the boat from a car that was there. As far as where the case stands now, it is really just beginning. It comes with a long list of criminal charges, as you can probably assume, from that video, including first-degree murder for the shooting death of Sergeant Schwartz, also shooting with intent to kill, assault and battery with a dangerous weapon, and shooting from a vehicle. Again, we haven't been able to contact Plank or an attorney for him at this time. Tom. Okay, Maggie Vespa for us. Maggie, we thank you. We want to head to Las Vegas where a manhunt is underway for the suspect who fatally stabbed a reporter known for his work covering organized crime and corruption. So was this random or a targeted attack? Gotti Schwartz has more. Tonight, the Las Vegas community in mourning after one of their own, a journalist was killed. Police say award-winning investigative reporter Jeff German was stabbed to death on Saturday outside of his home after an altercation. Authorities now releasing these photos of a suspect who is still at large. German joined the Las Vegas Review Journal in 2010 after more than two decades at the Las Vegas Sun, according to the paper. And he was known for breaking big stories about organized crime, corruption and political scandals. The Committee to Protect Journalists writing today that law enforcement should, quote, conduct a swift and thorough investigation into the killing of journalist Jeff German, determine whether he was targeted for his work, and hold those responsible to account. Our affiliate KSNV spoke with a columnist of the Review Journal who said German hadn't told leadership about any concerns for his safety. Jeff did not uh, convey that he was in an, any um, danger of, of as far as sources who might or contacts who might want to do him harm. The photos of the suspect still leave much unanswered, showing someone wearing a bright orange jacket, large straw hat, and dark colored pants carrying a blue duffel bag. In a press release, investigators say they think the suspect was possibly, quote, casing the area for other crimes before the deadly attack, and Las Vegas police now asking residents to check their video cameras for any additional footage of the suspect on Friday. News of German's death sending shockwaves around the community. Nevada Governor Steve Sisolak tweeting in part, This is a tragic loss for our community. Jeff German was tough but fair and a great mentor to young reporters. And Las Vegas' Mayor Carolyn Goodman writing in part, This was a senseless act of violence. All right, Gotti Schwartz joins us now live from Los Angeles. Gotti, do we have any reason to believe at this point he was targeted for his work against the mob? Uh, yeah, Tom, he was described as fearless in his reporting on uh, on corruption, on mob, on organized crime. So naturally, that's the first thought that a lot of people have when they learn about his killing. But at this point, police haven't said if it was related to any of his reporting, Tom. All right, Gotti, while you uh, put in your, your IFB there in your, I want to make sure you still got us. To go back to that person they're looking for, they think he may have been committing other crimes in the area, not exactly targeting uh, Jeff German. 
Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh, at this point, Metro Police uh, haven't released any specifics for when they were asked. They did say that they have some leads, and that has led them to pursue a specific subject or a specific suspect. But at this point, they haven't released that person's identity or motive. And right now, that suspect is still on the loose. All right, Gotti Schwartz for us and dealing with some audio issues there. Gotti, we appreciate it. When we come back, the street battle, a dangerous chase spilling onto a New York City sidewalk in broad daylight. What happened when one of the car's passengers got out armed with a gun? That's next. All right, we are back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the tragic new details in a deadly seaplane crash off the coast of Washington State. Authorities have identified all 10 people who were on board. The victims include a well-known winemaker, his wife, who is the sister of smash actress Megan Hilty, and their daughter. The prop plane went down roughly 40 miles north of Seattle on Sunday. Only one body so far has been recovered. All right, and police are searching for the suspects behind a wild car chase on Manhattan's Upper East Side. You have to see this video. Video shows a black Mercedes crash into a Toyota and push it onto the sidewalk, both cars going the wrong way. The Toyota driver briefly gets away and is rammed a second time. An armed man then seen running out of the Mercedes before stealing $20,000 from inside the Toyota. No bystanders were injured and no arrests so far have been made. All right, we want to turn now to Baldy, Texas, and the difficult and emotional first day of school there as children returned after the shooting massacre that killed 19 students and two teachers. Morgan Chesky is there. In Uvalde, after months of anticipation, a cautious first step. I was nervous at first, but then my friend Devin came. The first day of school now behind this community, shattered by the massacre last May. Hopefully it's a better blessed year for all the children. This morning as buses rolled in, parents walked alongside their children. The trauma still fresh. Drill them on if anything happened again, you know, try to make it out the window, run, don't scream, you know, call me. Those first day nerves hitting some harder than others. I told all of my kids that I love them and we'd pick them up after school. It's the same thing I told Lexi, same thing I promised her. Kimberly and Felix Rubio brought their children to school today, remembering their daughter Lexi, who last year was among those who didn't come home. Do you feel safer dropping them off today more so than three months ago? When my children aren't with me, I don't feel like they're safe. I don't want my daughter to just be remembered for what happened to her. I want her to be remembered for change. Schools remembering Uvalde statewide as students, teachers, even police officers donned coyote maroon. Everyone showing support for the town, forever honoring those 21 lives lost. All right, Morgan joins us tonight from Uvalde. Morgan, we were both there for that horrific event back in May, and I'm listening to those parents now, and, and I can't imagine what it's, what it's like for them. It almost seems like every parent in that district is essentially preparing their child for the worst. Yeah, Tom, there was a lot of apprehension on behalf of parents here today. We heard from mothers praying for their children before dropping them off here at school. Everyone acknowledges that while there have been some security improvements, not enough has been done. This trauma is still incredibly fresh here in this community, uh, especially for those who lost a child or who knew someone who did. Uh, that loss is still permeating throughout this entire town. And while this is a step forward in a first day of school, uh, the pain is still very real. You know, Morgan, we know that one of the big aspects of what happened there in Uvalde was the inaction of the school district police. And there's been so much raw emotion from the parents and from the people who live in that community, which is so understandable. And it feels like from your reporting over the past few weeks and months that that sentiment really has not changed. Yeah, Tom, it really hasn't. They've pointed to the fence and more security guards being at the school as minor changes, but they say that there is still so much that needs to be done uh, to bring parents peace of mind here. And I want to point out that that doesn't just include actions on behalf of the Uvalde School District. Uh, the parents of Lexi Rubio, the young girl who was killed on May 24th, one of 19 students killed, told me that they truly believe that they will not 
rest until they see that age rise from 18 to 21 to purchase a rifle or an all-out federal ban on assault weapons. And they say that that is now their mission going forward. On the local level, of course, they want to see these schools hardened up security-wise. But on a bigger scale, they want to make sure what happened to Lexi never happens to another student. Tom? Morgan Chesky reporting from a newly installed security fence there at one of the schools in Uvalde. Morgan, thank you. Of course, it's not just Uvalde. Children nationwide are returning to the classroom with fears of more school shootings. Parents and school districts are taking action, trying to prevent another tragedy. NBC Stephen Romo has the details. At this school in northern New Jersey, seniors begin another year comfortable in these hallways. But a familiar fear also lurks around this school, like so many others across the country. I know that there was a threat last year, and it was taken with the utmost importance. It is scary thinking about how somebody could come into your school and do something like that, but um, I try not to think about negatives. Just four months after the Uvalde massacre, parents and school districts are taking action to keep their children safe. Now show me how you use your bulletproof backpack. One Oklahoma mom going viral last week. The shooter is in there. You do not say a word. Cassie Walton running active shooter drills with her five-year-old son before his first day of school. And it's not just children and parents reacting. A district in Oxford, Michigan introducing new tech, biometric scanners that can detect weapons, new locks that make the doors impossible to open, in addition to demanding clear backpacks and hiring more armed personnel. All coming after a November 2021 shooting at Oxford High School that left four students dead and seven injured. In Ohio, Governor Mike DeWine announcing funding for schools to implement upgrades like security cameras, automatic door locks, and visitor badges, while also allowing teachers to carry guns after less than 24 hours of training. Back here in New Jersey, the state's spending millions of dollars on digital maps like these. They show both public and private schools, and they're designed to give to first responders in the event of an emergency like a school shooting. Stuck between the schools and the politics are the parents. With the shootings happening, it's just a fear. It's um. It's, I think, the ideology of raising a child in the United States. That's what's become the fear. Some with children as young as four forced to have conversations about mass shootings. When the Uvalde shooting happened, we didn't go into specifics with her. We did say that a lot of kids had gotten hurt and some of them were no longer with us. These are conversations I don't remember having as a child with my parents. And for the students, <laughs> excitement. We have prom and homecoming. And I know it's super cliche, but it's, it's a part of high school and I'm really excited for that and concern. It's scary for everyone in high schools everywhere. As America begins a new school year. All right, Stephen Romo joins us now live from Union City, New Jersey. Tonight. Stephen, I want to go back to those digital maps you were just showing us. How exactly will the first responders use them? Yeah, Tom, they're quite extensive. They show entrances and exits, uh, basically any access point to these different school buildings. And they could be useful for not only the case of a shooting, but also a situation like a fire. Right now, they have about half of their schools mapped, and they're going to spend about $6.5 million to get the other 1,500 mapped. So, you know, we heard there in your story, there's all types of new technology uh, being used in these schools. There's new security precautions nationwide. H how are parents and students that you spoke to feeling about all this? Yeah, it's sort of an interesting mix, Tom. A lot of the people we talked to today say they do feel safer knowing all this technology is in place, all of the badges that you have to use to enter the building. But a lot of these students, their whole lives, they've lived in a, a school system that's been post Sandy Hook. So in the back of many of their minds is the possibility that a shooting could still happen, Tom. So sad. All right, Stephen Romo for us. Steve, we appreciate it. Now to top stories, Global Watch and the massive manhunt for one of two suspects behind a stabbing attack in Canada. You may have heard about this over the weekend. Police in Saskatchewan swarming an Indian reservation for Miles Sanderson. He and his brother Damien, who was found dead yesterday, are accused of carrying out a stabbing rampage Sunday that left 10 people dead. Authorities say Miles may be fleeing towards the U.S. Next to the race to find survivors after a major earthquake in southwestern China, dash cam footage captures the moment that 6.8 magnitude quake hit the Sichuan province 
Residents in several cities pulled from collapsed buildings. The quake also triggering landslides and flooding in rural areas, prompting water rescues. At least 65 people killed and hundreds have been injured. And voters in Chile have overwhelmingly rejected a new constitution in a blow to the country's new leftist and young president. The progressive constitution was designed to replace the current one, which was written under a military dictatorship. Many voters considering this draft too liberal and too drastic. Now to the political shift in the UK. Queen Elizabeth sitting down with new prime minister Liz Truss, marking a change in government after Boris Johnson's scandal ridden time in office and resignation. Keir Simmons reports. Tonight, a rare public appearance by Queen Elizabeth for the first time in over a month. Britain's increasingly frail monarch clutching a walking stick while shaking hands with her 15th prime minister. Queen Elizabeth appointing Elizabeth Truss, the UK's third female leader. The two women making history in more ways than one. Prime Minister Truss travelling 500 miles to Balmoral Castle because of the Queen's mobility issues. That hasn't happened for 140 years. Back in Downing Street, a downpour soaking her supporters. Liz Truss arriving for business. Her warning of economic storms ahead, invoking comparisons to Margaret Thatcher. We now face severe global headwinds. And there she is, beginning work. Together we can ride out the storm, she said. Classic Thatcher. On her first day in 1979, Britain's first female prime minister faced inflation, strikes and recession. Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. All right, Keir Simmons joins us now from London. Keir, I'll go back to those Margaret Thatcher comparisons in a moment. But first, your general observations of the Queen. So much is being written about her health. And, of course, this unprecedented meeting today. Was it to keep the Queen from not having to travel too much? You know, Tom, one aspect I think we can forget about the Queen is that she is a 96-year-old proud woman who's led an amazing life and that any change, well, then she has to agree to that change. If you think back to the, the Jubilee, there were all those plans for her to go to the races, to the Trooping the Colour, to all of those events. Then they were cancelled, cancelled and cancelled. This time, I think that her advisers and clearly in the end, the Queen herself felt it was better if she stayed in Scotland just in case it didn't work out to come down here to Buckingham Palace because this was such an important constitutional moment. But, wow, what a historic moment. Not seen something like that for 140 years, not since the reign of Queen Victoria, Tom. And, and Keir, you know, you mentioned there some people are comparing trust to former Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. What are the similarities and, and what do yeah. they tell us? And also, remind our viewers of the economic headwinds trust is up against right now in the UK. Oh, huge economic headwinds. You want to talk about inflation over there? Over here, they're talking about perhaps 20% inflation. They're talking about a multi-billion dollar band-aid. That's a big band-aid to try to stop British businesses from going bust, including pubs, for example, up and down the country. And the Prime Minister, now in 10 Downing Street there, has to do all that and try to cut taxes the way she's promised without causing a debt crisis. That's the comparison to Margaret Thatcher because, as we mentioned, when she walked into Downing Street in 1979, she faced similar economic headwinds and many strikes across the country. She went to Oxford University. Liz Truss went to Oxford University. She was from a middle-class family. Liz Truss is from a middle-class family. And they both, as far as we can tell right now, appear to have shared this orthodoxy that you let people lead their own lives and that if you cut taxes, you give people back the opportunity to build their own careers, their own economic opportunity. But will it work in the current economic crisis that this country and many countries around the world look like they're about to face? That is the big question for the new prime minister there in 10 Downing Street. Keir Simmons from London tonight. Keir, thank you. Coming up, the drama on and off the screen. Rumored cast conflicts clouding the premiere of the star-studded film Don't Worry Darling, the moment between Harry Styles and Chris Pine that was all the buzz today. Stay with us. 
All right, we are back now with the wild drama surrounding the most talked about movie on the internet right now. Don't worry, darling. Better known for its controversy off the screen rather than the performance on it, premiering, of course, at the Venice Film Festival. The mess surrounding the film, directed by Olivia Wilde and starring Florence Pugh and Harry Styles, coming to a head this weekend with a series of uncomfortable and bizarre moments following two years of drama and internet gossip. To help break it all down for us, let's bring in Variety Senior Editor of Culture and Events. Mark Malkin. Mark, I want you to act like you're speaking to somebody who's from another planet and has no idea what is going on with this film and the drama surrounding it. So I want to start here where my producers say we need to start, which is some of the behind the scenes of the movie and director Olivia Wilde and star Florence Pugh, of course. Pugh was not at a press conference ahead of the red carpet premiere, apparently. And there's some something of Wilde and, and what she said about the star's absence. Hear what she had to say. Florence is a force, and we are so grateful that she's able to make it tonight, despite being in production on Dune. I know as a director how disruptive it is to lose an actor even for a day, so I'm very grateful to her, grateful to Denis Villeneuve for helping us, um, and we're really thrilled we'll get to celebrate her work tonight. All right, but it seems like that was not the case since Pew's stylist posted on Instagram that she had already arrived in Venice earlier that day. So can you tell us more about what's going on here with this relationship over the course of the movie and where they are today? Where they are today is they are not in Venice together. So Florence did end up in Venice, like you just showed. She was there while Olivia was talking about her not being there. Apparently, the bad blood stems from Florence not being too thrilled that Olivia Wilde and her co-star, Harry Styles, started an off-camera relationship during filming, was not too pleased that Olivia wasn't around as much as she thinks she should be around. So that has just steamrolled into this epic, epic drama at the Venice Film Festival, where Florence said, yep, I'm going to come. I'm going to walk the red carpet for the premiere. I'm going to watch the movie, and then I am out. So there was also a video that original cast member Shia LaBeouf, who didn't make it into the film, uh, he released last week or a couple weeks ago where it added fire to this feud, correct? Yeah, so Olivia Wilde did a, an amazing cover story here um, at Variety, you know, uh, as a preview to Venice, in which she said that she fired Shia LaBeouf from the movie. He was replaced by Harry Styles. Well, Shia read the story and then sent out an open letter to Olivia saying, I was not fired. I have the receipts. I actually quit and actually had video that seemingly shows Olivia saying to Shia, I want to make this work. Yeah. How is that playing out for Olivia Wilde? How, how are people sort of interpreting that, that series of events? I mean, this is just, you know, everyone is saying, you know, if she... If she believes she fired him, then, you know, she said what she believes. But other people are saying, you said you fired him, but then there's this video. Did you not know this video existed where it doesn't look like you fired him? It is a very he said, she said, but Shia came with the receipts. OK, and then there's this other incident, which I know is sort of blowing up on the Internet, um, which is about Harry Styles and co-star Chris Pine. And, and during the premiere, there's a video circulating online that kind of sort of looks like Harry Styles spit on Pine. I don't think so. We know a representative for Pine saying almost immediately that Harry did not spit on Chris and that two have only respect for each other. Is this just a series of, of publicity stunts for a movie that was considerably low budget? It's not, no, you listen, I'm, I could get very cynical and say, this is all planned. This was not planned. I will tell you, when I saw the first video, when I saw the headlines coming out that Harry spit on Chris Pine, I'm like, what is this? I look at that first video and I'm like, it really looks like he spit on Chris Pine. Then um, another video from another angle, it doesn't look like he spit at all. <laughs> But it's just, this is, everyone now wants the movie about the making of this movie. Yeah, no, no, that actually, could, that would be an incredible film, and it's a great idea. I, but I do want to ask you, how is the movie? What, what are the reviews like? The reviews are very warm, you know, very lukewarm, saying, you know, there's splashy performances, it's okay. It doesn't look like it's going to be a box office hit. Yes, the Harry Style fans are going to come out for this movie. But there's a lot of pressure on Olivia Wilde. Remember, her first film, Book Smart did really, really well. It was a critic's darling. It was get, winning awards left and right. And this was her follow-up. And it just 
did not go the way Booksmart went. You know, don't worry, darling. I think everyone is worrying. I got to tell you, though, there's so much buzz behind this film that I wouldn't be surprised if it just rocks the box office, if people are just so curious to see what this film's about. I do want to ask you one more thing. This stood out to me. Uh, Harry Styles on the red carpet, and let's just call it a look, okay? This, this is a look. Everyone in the studio right now is, is taking a look at that collar right there. Is this the new style, this sort of, I don't know, is it, is it overblown? Is it, is it a collar on steroids? I'm not sure what to call it, but, but what are your thoughts on this, Mark? Tom, you call it fashion. You call it fashion, Tom. You cannot say anything bad about Harry style fashion. I literally was having this discussion with a friend last night. I love everything this guy wears. He's dressed by Gucci. If I could afford Gucci, I would be having that collar on your show right now. You'd have to do a wide shot because to get the collar in, but that is fashion, Tom. I think you should start rocking that Okay, now. no, I just don't know what tie to put with that. Is it a bigger tie? Is it a smaller tie? I'd, I'd have to figure that out. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.